Welcome uh, to the New America Foundation. I'm Reed Kramer. I direct our asset building program. Um, and we're very pleased that you're here uh, to join us for this event uh, in the room and uh, on our online audience as well. Uh, the event is titled Economic Mobility, What's the Problem and What to Do About It? Uh, very timely uh, topic, obviously, these days. Uh, for those of you in Twitter land, and I think you know who you are, uh, we'll be using the hashtag EconMobility. Um, and uh, if people do weigh in with comments or questions, uh, one of my colleagues is going to come up and let me know, so maybe your, your questions and contributions will be uh, worked into the conversation as well. Uh, my colleagues and I in the asset building program, uh, we focus a lot of our work on advancing policy ideas uh, to help families with fewer resources and lower incomes uh, move forward in their lives and move up the uh, economic ladder. Uh, so we do care about very poor people. Uh, we also care about many other people in our uh, society as well and that there's a functioning safety net that's there for them uh, and many others. Uh, we recognize that the safety net uh, has to work for many different kinds of people with di different circumstances uh, at different points uh, of their lifetime. So it's not just the very poor, uh, it's many more of us uh, that come into contact with the safety net. And you know, certainly the safety net has to provide the cushion that's there for a basic level of resources and, and support for, uh, for every member of society. Uh, I think there's a moral, there's an ethical obligation to look after each other, uh, especially those of us uh, that have less in this prosperous uh, society. So the cushion has to work. But the safety net also needs to be the trampoline that is there for uh, when families kind of fall on hard times and then need a boost uh, back up to get on their way. Um, the safety net also needs to work as the, the, the springboard that is there if somebody is kind of exerting themselves and aspiring upward, it's there to launch them uh, forward uh, in their lives. So anyway, these are some metaphors to think about uh, that we can use in our discussion when we talk about the safety net um, and um, what kind of related public policy programs uh, are in play. You know, recently there have been questions about how we structure the safety net. Um, what it, uh, what it can do, what it doesn't do, and, and perhaps it's about time that we have this conversation at a, at a broader level. Uh, I've long argued that the trampoline and the springboard uh, portions of the net you know, need to consider how families can save and build up resources and assets over time so that they can be deployed strategically to deal with unexpected events, emergencies, job loss, a lot of the things that have come up uh, with the Great Recession. Um, and uh, you know, with discussions of the recession, we've, we've certainly had an awareness that some other trends are happening in the society, you know, such as the, the, the perception that there's growing inequality uh, of income and concentration of wealth at the very top. Um, so I think the focus on inequality, both with wealth and income, is relevant to our collective uh, aspirations as a democracy, uh, and as a meritocracy, as a society. Now, some conservative leaders in this conversation have said, uh, you know, we should care less about inequality per se in its own right and more about mobility. And here they emphasize that uh, America still leads the world. Uh, you know, the problem is, is I've looked at the data, and maybe we'll talk about this today, uh, that might not be true anymore. You know, we, we might lag substantially if, if it was ever true uh, in, in the recent uh, past. President Obama has also begun talking about these themes and, and looking at the prospects of, of uh, upward mobility. He's talked about in his speech in Kansas, a child having kind of dimmed prospects over time to advance um, someone that was born in, into poverty. Um, he's also identified the path to inclusive prosperity as the defining issue of our time. And in doing so is connecting the conversation around inequality to poverty and to mobility. So there's a lot of claims going back and forth uh, at this time, and I think it's t it is high time then to track down some data 
and uh, some facts, lead them in, in, put them into the discussion, and that's why we're here today. That's what the event is designed to do, uh, to elevate the discussion of mobility by considering some basic questions. What's mobility? How do we define it? Um, how is it connected to intergenerational poverty and inequality? How does America compare with other countries? Uh, has the climb become more arduous, or is it just persistently difficult? Uh, and then, finally and importantly, you know, what do we do about it? How do we re repair the safety net, modernize it, make it work for uh, all of us as a, as a cushion, a springboard, as the trampoline? Uh, and you know, there, there's a lot of challenges here in addressing these, these questions. Uh, there's data limitations. The data is not as good or as timely as we'd like it to be. Um, this is also a very politically charged space to have this conversation. Um, but we're here anyway, and uh, we've invited Scott uh, Winship to join us to help address some of these challenges and share some of his work in his perspective, uh, address some of these challenges, uh, maybe create some new challenges and obstacles along the way. Um, so he's going to offer his perspective on, on some work that he's been doing. Um, he's currently a fellow at the, of Economic Studies at the Brookings uh, Institution, and he's former uh, research manager of the Economic Mobility Project at the Pew uh, Charitable Trust. Um, before that, he was at Third Way while he was finishing his PhD uh, from, from Harvard. Where, what, what program were you in? Uh, social policy, social policy uh, uh, at Harvard. I've heard of that. Um, and uh, let's see, the, the Pew Economic Mobility Project's done very uh, good work. Uh, they've, they've created a real catalog of research. Scott really helped lead some of those efforts. I serve actually as a principal uh, on that uh, project and co-authored a paper a couple of years ago looking at the role that savings plays in mobility. But really it's a broad um, catalog of work now that is really helping to inform this uh, discussion and Scott helped shepherd that through. Um, he's also looked at mobility and economic security for a number of, from, from a number of different angles. Uh, so he's got a story uh, to tell. Uh, and in fact, uh, to show you that it's such a timely topic, yesterday he was testifying on the Hill before the Senate uh, Budget Committee on this very topic. And I think that testimony is available uh, publicly on the website, along with your other work, uh, is available on the Brookings Institution uh, webpage. Um, and uh, we're fortunate to have a uh, really excellent uh, discussant uh, for today's session. Uh, Sean uh, Firmstead is an attorney and senior research associate at the Center for Economic Policy Research, E-C-E-R-P. So I always complain about their acronym because I think it's really awkward. But they do excellent work. They're a really valuable uh, source for a lot of good um, um, analysis and and Sean has really been thinking about and writing about mobility issues for a number of years he's incubated policy ideas into the discussion uh, and he's kind of thought about how to how to connect them to larger political discourse so we're going to hear from him uh, as well so Scott's going to come up first so uh, we'll start the proceedings he'll have a PowerPoint then Sean will come up with his remarks in a PowerPoint then I'll pop back up and we'll have an extended discussion including uh, all of you so Scott welcome Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Reed. I'm uh, excited that we're on Twitter, although I think it's unfortunate that we're competing with health policy valentines as a hashtag. Uh, my entry in that was this Valentine's Day, let me treat you to an individual mandate. Uh, there, there are others which are much better. Um, Let's see. But uh, uh, thanks again to Reed and to the New America Foundation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak today. I think this is a topic uh, that is tough to tell a complicated story on uh, in the environment that is DC. Um, all the all the sort of incentives and pressures I think are to tell an uncomplicated story, and it's I think fairly rare that uh, that you have an event like this um, where you sort of get a chance to uh, to to hear. A more complicated version, of course, have a great uh, discussion uh, at, the, at the end. Um, I'm going to focus in my talk uh, on, on just sort of the basic facts around economic mobility and ways to think about it. Uh, it's a huge topic. 
Um, some of this I'm um, happy to come back to um, during the Q&A as well as talk about policy during the Q&A or, or broader issues around inequality or insecurity. Um, but broadly speaking, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start big and, and narrow it down. And, and largely, the way that I'm narrowing it down is driven by the research that's been done. Uh, so, you know, you can think of, of economic mobility in terms of earnings, in terms of income, uh, in terms of wealth, education, occupation. Uh, it, I'm going to focus today on earnings and income. Uh, I, I uh, am familiar with the wealth, education, occupation literature that we can chat about if folks are interested in that, but, but by far the bulk of the research has been done uh, on earnings and income. Uh, Further, you can uh, distinguish between intergenerational mobility and intragenerational mobility. So uh, it, uh, whether uh, kids uh, do better or worse than their parents, or if you just look at workers over, say, a 10 or 20 year period, how much upward and downward mobility do they experience? Uh, again, here, most of the research is in intergenerational, um, but th there's a fair amount of research in intragenerational as well. Uh, I think the two generally show similar results. Um, so again, we can come back to that if folks want to talk about it. And of course, you have uh, this issue of direction. You have upward mobility. You have downward mobility. You have just kind of general churn um, uh, that adds another layer of complication. Um, and then you have this issue of relative mobility versus absolute mobility versus the persistence of gaps. So let me say a little bit about that. Um, the idea behind relative mobility is, uh, do you end up roughly in the same place in terms of rankings? Uh, that your parents did. Uh, so it, so if your parents were in the bottom fifth when you were a child, is it likely that you will also remain in the bottom fifth? Now note that over time, the bottom fifth can actually become uh, a, a more a richer group uh, because of economic growth. So there's this other idea of mobility uh, uh, that you can think of as absolute mobility, and that's just, do you end up better off than your parents, even if in terms of rankings, you don't end up moving at all, uh, or do you end up worse off than your parents? Um, and then finally, there's this uh, this concept I'm calling persistence of gaps. The idea is that uh, if you have two two parents who uh, vary by some factor in terms of how much income that they have, how much of a gap does that translate into in the next generation for their kids? Um, and and I'll uh, I'll talk about each of these things uh, as I go along. Um, Okay, so I'm going to frame this around how we assess whether we have a problem or not. Uh, and uh, I think there are broadly three ways. Um, you can look at trends and say, are things getting worse? Are things getting better? Uh, we can compare ourselves to other countries and see how we fare uh, on that basis. Or we have what I'm calling the, the Potter Stewart criterion, uh, Supreme Court justice who said of a very different problem that, you know, I know it when I see it. I said this at the committee yesterday, and there were no laughs. I don't know if it's just <laughs> not a good joke or if people didn't get this is, this is porn. It, it, it's edgy. It's edgy. That's my, much like my Valentine's uh, uh, health policy tweet. Um, so I'm going to uh, run through the evidence on, on each of these things um, and, and kind of make a case that uh, for, for some ways of thinking about whether we have a problem and uh, that, that there's more compelling evidence than for others. So first, starting with trends, um, big caveat, uh, with two exceptions, the previous research comes from a single data set. It's a workhorse data set that everybody in academia and in the think tank world uses, the panel study of income dynamics. Um, but nevertheless, uh, most of it comes from, uh, from that single data set. Uh, because of that, uh, generally, we're restricted to looking at trends for, uh, for people born in the late 1940s, at the earliest in the late 1960s, at the latest. Um, and specifically for men, uh, I think, you know, m many of you who do research know that kind of trying to figure out how you interpret trends among women has kind of flummoxes researchers because of this issue of taking time out of the workforce uh, to, for child rearing and things like that and the, and the dramatic extent to which that has changed over time, which, which complicates how you interpret a lot of these numbers. Um, there, so, so I'll say you can go back to before the late 1940s, if you look at things like occupation mobility, and we can chat about that if folks are interested. Um, all that said, um, looking at upward and downward relative mobility, so do you, uh, are you able to transcend the ranking that your parents had, or if you start, uh, if you start off well, do you, 
do you fall uh, in terms of rankings. Uh, there's probably been little change uh, in the last 60 years. Um, the, the bulk of the evidence, uh, it, it, you find individual studies that find a small increase, a small decline, um, but there's, there's, if there's any consistent finding um, in, in the PSID, this one data set, uh, it's that there are probably small increases in mobility um, over time, uh, but I don't think anybody would really bank too heavily on that being a real, a real result. Um, uh, and actually, for upward and downward mobility, there's only been two or three studies uh, that have been done. Um, now, the administration, some of you may remember, uh, in the Osawatomi speech in December, uh, had this really provocative claim that, uh, that I ended up spending some time looking into and, uh, and I think, debunking, um, which was that uh, for people who um, start out in the uh, bottom, uh, the chances that they would make it to the middle class uh, had, had actually, uh, so the chances that when they become adults, they, they're in the middle class, have fallen uh, from about 50% um, kind of mid-century mid down to uh, 40% around 1980, uh, and then they projected to 33% for, for today's kids. Those were based um, on uh, a, a very elaborate and clever modeling exercise, um, largely because we don't have information for people born after uh, after the late 1960s, and so that's in some ways that's the only way you can you can figure out uh, what the what the mobility of, of kids born in say 1980 was. Uh, but but uh, I, in a piece that I wrote for National Review um, showed that that model turned out uh, to to be pretty fragile. I think um, I used some some actual data to to kind of look at this. It's not ideal. It looks at uh, people in their in their 20s. Um, ideally, you want to look at sort of older folks who have had some time, especially the ones that went to school, to, to kind of take advantage of the extra income that their schooling brought in. Um, but I found that uh, that generally between kids born in the early 1960s and kids born in the early 1980s, that there hadn't really been uh, any decline. And if anything, there had been a small increase in upward mobility from the bottom. Um, Okay, so that's upward and downward mobility. You also have this thing called the intergenerational elasticity. This is this, this idea of whether gaps in one generation translate to similarly sized gaps in another generation. Um, that also probably hasn't changed much in 60 years. There's been more research done on this than for upward and downward uh, uh, relative mobility. Um, the big caveat is that there are the two studies that don't use this workhorse data set uh, find that there has been a decline in mobility. Um, those two end up having to use some pretty technical and I would say kind of controversial uh, strategies for getting around the data problems that makes everybody use the workhorse, the, the other data set. Um, uh, so two out of about eight that have been done um, show that there's been an increase over time. Uh, and then finally, if you look at absolute mobility, uh, it's almost surely risen. I don't know of any uh, studies that have actually looked at it. Um, again, uh, this has been an issue uh, in, in recent weeks with uh, the administration, um, the chair of the, of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, Alan Kruger, uh, gave a talk um, in which he argued, so, so it's related to this idea of a shrinking middle class, right? So, uh, so uh, Alan Kruger presented estimates that showed that uh, if you define the middle class as being uh, at least half of median income uh, and no more than 1.5 times median income, uh, that, that that group had declined from about 50% of the population in 1970 uh, to about 42% uh, of the population uh, uh, today. And so this is a chart that I just uh, took directly from, from his talk, uh, dramatic chart. Um, it turned out when, when I looked into that that this is actually a function of, so if you define the middle class as between these two thresholds, there's two ways it can shrink. People can get poorer or people can get richer. And what's actually happened is that people have gotten richer. Um, and so uh, th these are the numbers that I crunched. The, the, the dates are a little bit different, but it it's, doesn't matter if you use the exact same dates. They compare peak uh, peak years in each case. So the first the first side, I, I was able to replicate exactly the the results that were presented. So I knew that I understood what he was doing. But then I sort of looked at uh, whether people end up at least middle class, uh, so middle class or better. 
that hasn't changed uh, over time at all. Um, you can do it a bunch of different ways. I sort of have had an internal debate with some folks at Brookings, um, and coming out of that, I uh, came up with this other set of estimates, uh, which uh, uses people instead of households. It uh, adjusts for household size. Household size have declined over time. Um, that means that any given household uh, is sharing a given amount among fewer people. Um, so they're better off. Uh, health insurance has become a bigger part of uh, income and compensation over time. Uh, in rising Hispanic immigration, uh, which has certainly benefited the immigrants, um, and, and I mean, there's debate about whether it's hurt native-born workers or not. I don't think the evidence is that compelling. But what it clearly does is it pulls down in the data uh, what the typical uh, American has in income. And so if you don't adjust for that, you, you sort of don't you might attribute something, you might attribute, uh, you know, the things haven't improved to something about the labor market or, or, or what have you. But, but in reality, it's partly because we've admitted a lot of folks who are lower income, um, which helps them, uh, which helps the American economy. Um, but if you take those folks out, uh, which you can't, you can't do it as cleanly as you would. So if you just take all Hispanics out, um, then you get this increase over time in the number of, of households that are at least middle class. Um, okay, turning to cross-national comparisons, um, this is a chart that I pulled from uh, a report that the Economic Mobility Project uh, funded uh, by Miles Korak, um, who's a researcher at the University of Ottawa. Um, this just shows you for a, a number of different countries, European and English speaking, uh, this intergenerational elasticity. The way to interpret these things, so for the U.S., this number of 0.47 means that if you have uh, a man and his neighbor uh, where, where one has twice the income, the earnings of the other, uh, it's, if, you look at, if you then look at their sons when they're the same age, uh, the son, the, 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 the son that, that had the richer dad will have about 47% more than the son who had the poorer dad. So about half of the, half of the gap uh, is retained uh, over these generations. That number actually is probably, and, and Miles says this in his report, uh, if you do the best estimate, that number is actually probably closer to 60% rather than 50% uh, for the US. Um, interestingly, Canada, which is uh, very similar to the US in a lot of ways, uh, the number is, is 20%. So again, uh, two, two dads, uh, one is twice as rich as the other, look at their kids, the one from the richer dad will only have income 20% more than, uh, than the son of the younger dad. So pretty dramatic differences cross-nationally. Um, it turns out that to the, to the best we know, and, and essentially this is the only study that's been done, um, the way that we're unique, the way that we're uniquely bad, uh, is that uh, we don't lift poor men out of poverty as well as other countries do. So this uh, is a study uh, from Marcus Yanti, uh, who is a uh, Finnish economist, um, kind of the expert in this area. Looked at the US, the UK, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, separately sons and daughters. And uh, this is a little bit of a noisy chart. Over on the left, you see sort of what happened. If you had perfect mobility, then for kids who start at the bottom, 20% of them would end up uh, occupying each fifth in adulthood. Uh, so, so that you can sort of think of as what each of these, these other sets would look like if, if there were perfect mobility. Um, and what you can see is there's not, the, the countries sort of have very similar patterns in that very clearly for, for every country, uh, you know, you're more, if you start at the bottom, you're more likely to stay in the bottom than to end up at the very top, for instance. So you see these, uh, 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 these patterns across the countries for both sons and daughters. But between the countries, they don't actually differ all that much, uh, with the one exception that, that I don't have to point out at all. Um, so, uh, so there's evidence suggesting that, that we have a very specific problem uh, when it comes to uh, mobility versus other countries. Uh, whoa, I didn't realize that was animated. Okay. Um, so th they, the, the great thing about uh, Marcus is that he's very, very rigorous. They, so they tried to look at, at men and women roughly around the same time. In the US, it's using a survey called National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. So it's um, kids who were born in the late 50s and early 1960s who were then uh, adults 30-ish uh, years later, roughly. Um, but, but there are definitely comparability issues. Um, uh, and, and actually, uh, one point that I wanted to mention uh, is that we don't have any uh, evidence on 
cross-national differences in absolute mobility. Um, I don't know if I can tease or not that there may be a study coming that would, that would be funded by a foundation called the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, so, so the Economic Mobility Project actually has commissioned work by Marcus um, to, to get at this question of, all right, so we look, we look terrible uh, on relative mobility. What if you compared us on absolute <coughs> mobility? What would you find? Um, so that hopefully will be out uh, at some, some point soon. Um, okay, so related to, I had no idea this was animated. I cut this from, uh, <laughs> from the Kruger presentation. Um, uh, so this came up in Alan Kruger's speech, um, this idea that, uh, that cross-national differences in mobility um, are related to cross-national differences in inequality. Um, and so you can see along the x-axis, this is for each of uh, 10 countries, their inequality levels um, by a, a widely used measure of inequality. Um, and then on the y-axis, you have immobility. So kind of higher numbers there are worse. Uh, what you find is the more inequality you have, the more uh, immobility, the less mobility that you have. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, they did this exercise where they kind of projected um, what inequality, uh, what had happened in inequality since 1985 uh, to estimate this, uh, this point that shows that mobility in the U.S. is falling over time. So I, I bring all this up just because it relates to the argument about whether things are, are changing over time. I had some criticisms of this that are also that are on uh, Raihan Salam's uh, The Agenda uh, blog at National Review that, uh, that I would encourage folks to read. Um, essentially, this is, this is an exercise in correlation. So it turns out if you, you can actually plot uh, population size for these countries across the bottom, uh, and you get an almost uh, exactly strong relationship between the two. Um, so it's this basic idea of correlation. It's not causation. Uh, I would argue this is... Uh, a pretty a, a, a pretty uh, weak case uh, to argue that uh, that mobility is falling over time. Okay, so the last criterion is: do we know it when we see it? Um, so first, for absolute mobility, uh, th this is um, research also from EMP uh, that was done by my uh, colleagues at Brookings, Julia Isaacs, Isabel Sahil, and Ron Haskins. Uh, Essentially, if you look at kids, um, in the, you, you can actually see in the data what their parents made when they were growing up, and you can see what they made as adults. Turns out, eight, when you adjust for uh, the decline in household size, 80% of uh, Americans have higher incomes uh, than their parents did. So I, I think I, I, I don't want to understate how important that is. So regardless of what's happened with, with relative mobility, this is just, just this very striking finding. Now, it, I don't think anyone's dug in to see how much better off they are than their parents. Um, that's something that I'm interested in, in taking a look at. Um, but so this is where I sound complicated and not uh, rah rah USA. Um, we do have this problem of relative mobility, I would argue, uh, from the bottom. So again, uh, on the left uh, is what you would see if you had perfect mobility for kids. Um, uh, who start out anywhere. If you start out in the bottom, if you start out in the top, then 20% would end up in each of the fifths as adults. Instead, what you see is um, for, for kids who start in the bottom, 42% of them will, will remain in the bottom. Now, what's interesting is that number you will see cited uh, by, uh, by some conservatives, and, and they'll say, this is fantastic. 60% of people make it out of the bottom. So there, there's, there's room for uh, different perspectives here. I, I, I don't want to uh, diminish that. The, the point that I always raise um, is if you look at those last two bars, the 11 and the 6, so if you start in the bottom, you have about a 17% chance of making it to the upper middle class. Now, all of us in this room, not all of us, most of us in this room either are there or will be there by age 40, which is when, uh, when the, uh, the, the, the kids are, are examined. Uh, it's about $90,000 for a household, um, so not for an individual, for a household. Um, but you only have a 17% chance of actually of getting that far uh, if you start in the bottom. Meanwhile, if you start in the top two-fifths, if you start upper middle class, um, then your kids have about a 60% chance of staying there. So that's, that's kind of the difference between picking the right parents. Uh, it's, it's a 60% chance versus a 17% chance. I think that uh, is something that none of us should be satisfied with, regardless of whether things are getting better or whether we uh, look good or bad versus other countries. Um, so wrapping up my bottom line, economic mobili mobility is alive and well. Um, kind of a, a theme running through this and some other things that I've, I've written lately. I had a piece in the, uh, the New Republic on their website earlier this week with the unfortunate title of something like 
don't worry, the middle class is doing just fine. Um, that was a little uh, more overstated than what I would have titled it. Um, but I, I do think that we worry too much about the middle class, um, this issue of the middle class shrinking, uh, that, the middle, the, that the American dream is fading for the broad middle. It's not true. And I would argue that scaring the middle class into thinking that things are worse than they are, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a real uh, strategy for some folks, um, it, it is is not likely to produce the outcomes that you want. It, it, there's there's arguments that that when people are insecure, they you know rather than kind of inspiring more solidarity, people hoard uh, and and you become less generous to other folks. Um, uh, so that's my take home there. Uh, however, um, limited opportunity for kids to start at the, uh, who start out poor. Should concern everybody. Um, absolute mobility doesn't guarantee uh, that uh, that opportunity will will expand in terms of this idea of being able to to grow up to be whatever you want. Right. This is a pretty powerful uh, point to me that um, you know I think probably a lot of our parents said you know, when we were kids. Uh, you know, you you can grow up to be whatever you want. This is a, I think a really important idea and. You could have absolute mobility and everyone could end up quite a bit richer than their parents were. But if you don't have the opportunity to, uh, to occupy one of those top slots, in some sense, you know, you, your opportunity really is diminished. Um, personal responsibility matters, but kids don't choose their parents. Um, teenagers are not distinguished by farsighted decision making. Um, so that's it. Um, as I said, uh, I'm happy to talk about policies um, or any of the other uh, issues that I didn't chat about here. Um, but thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so that'll take you forward. Oh, OK. Great. Uh, there we go. OK, great. Thank you. Laser. Oh, this. Yeah. OK. <laughs> That's me, Sean. Um, OK, thanks a lot, Reed. Happy to be here at, at New America and to have the chance to address this um, important uh, issue. Um, you know, I should start by saying I think uh, Reed's last slide kind of summarizes the difference. Um, or I mean, Scott's last slide kind of summarizes the differences between us. I think uh, sort of summarize, uh, we should care about mobility at the bottom, but it's poverty, not inequality, that is the issue. We shouldn't overstate the problems of, of the middle class. It's really, again, sort of this focusing uh, on the bottom that matters. Now, you know, I'm a good Rawlsian social Democrat. It's not even very popular anymore, I know. Um, so I certainly have no quarrel with the idea that improving the economic security and opportunity of the least advantaged is not only extremely important, it's really kind of this, you know, most important criterion for how we should judge um, uh, our economy and how we should just kind of social justice more generally. But I disagree um, with Scott about, well, about pretty much everything else he has to say um, in this speech. So, and I'm going to say, you know, a lot of what I have to say here is um, keyed as much to Scott's testimony yesterday. I, I got this... Um, uh, Scott was up late last night, I know, uh, like I was putting this together, but, um, you know, I think it hits pretty much the same uh, point. So, you know, I think in particular I disagree with him on this issue of the linkage between inequality and mobility, and also really about the scale and effect of uh, inequality, um, which gets again to this issue of how it impacts mobility. Now, um, Here's somebody who takes the threat, I think, of in, in inequality seriously for mobility. Somebody who's pretty actually far to the right um, from me, um, and who, you know, we probably don't disagree much on the actual policy solutions, but as she says, this is Belle Sawhill, senior fellow um, at Brookings, growing inequality is a threat to social mobility. Um, when the rungs of the ladder become too far apart, it becomes exceedingly difficult to climb that ladder. The data on this relationship are quite clear. This is actually some of the data that's in dispute, I should note, however. And the nations with less uh, inequality have more mobility. Um, so let me just say a little bit about where I think the disagreements are uh, between at least Scott and I on this issue of the scale and effect of um, inequality. And um, here I'll uh, start with um, the scale. Um, so uh, going back to the congressional testimony yesterday, um, Scott argues that if we just look at the bottom 99% inequality has grown only modestly, if at all. Um, and basically what he does, and again, is this is kind of, you know, put, up, put the 1% to the side, focus just on that 99%. Now, there's really no good reason, of course, to ignore the extraordinarily large uh, income gains of the top 1%. 
Um, according to CBO, income just for the top 1% is growing by about 280% uh, um, cumulative over 79 to 2007. This, I should say, is using a very comprehensive definition of income. We've got here, this is after-tax household income. It includes in-kind benefits, including uh, health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, um, and employer-sponsored health insurance, um, some of the things conservatives always want counted. So this is about as you know, good as you can get in terms of income. Um, by contrast, you've got the median household growing at 35% um, uh, to that. So you've got um, a pretty good gap. I think there are a lot of good research-based reasons to think that this has had a detrimental impact on middle-class democracy, on economic growth, but we can just bracket those for the moment and, and, and look at this specific claim that among the 99%, there hasn't been this increase uh, in inequality. So here we've got, again, the CBO, the gold standard, the most recent report. This is the 99%, so it's by uh, quintiles. Um, 1979, again, to 2007, so about 20, I think it's 28 years there. Um, sure, there's been, I guess, absolute you know, income growth uh, here uh, across the quintiles. So the, for the lowest, it's 18%. Um, but compare that, and you see this real dispersion across uh, the income groups. This is a growing a part in income terms any way uh, you look at it. You know, so one question here is, is this modest? Um, um, you know, in one sense, uh, you compare it to the 280% for the 1%, it may seem modest in terms of the differences, um, but um, these are still pretty large differences. Uh, you know, another thing just to remember about these, this is 28 years cumulative growth, so if you want to look at kind of an annual growth rate, you've got to divide that. So you're, you know, you're looking at about 0.5% a year um, in terms of real income growth on the bottom, uh, you know, maybe about 2% at the very top. Um, now, you know, I think the other sort of standard and the way to think about this in terms of, you know, is it modest, is to think about in this sort of golden, you know, era of uh, income growth, the post-war era. This is 1949 to 79. I'm sure people are familiar with this chart. You've seen it. EPI, others have um, done a very good job of kind of um, making sure people are aware of this data. So this is the growth in before-tax household income. So it's not totally comparable. We, just, we don't have as good a thing as the CBO data here. But um, what you see, this is what broadly shared prosperity looks like. So the lowest quintile actually has the strongest growth, 116% um, uh, over that 30-year period. The top quintile, of course, does pretty well too, but, but everybody has income growth. Um, you know, this is not, of course, also, I should say, a quality of um, outcomes or results. Um, you know, the people on the top are seeing a lot more in terms of dollars. This is just kind of a quality in terms of a rough and quality in terms of percentage gains. Um, so that's, I think, what you really have to kind of think about and have in the back of your head when you're thinking about how are we doing now and are we having modest or, or, or um, not at all in terms of inequality. Okay, now, Scott does another move in his testimony. He says to dispute the growth among the 99%, he actually argues that the cost of living has risen less for the poor and the middle class than for upper income households. Now this is, I think, a pretty extraordinary claim when you think about it. Basically the idea is, you know, you have to give people cost of living increases as um, human resources manager, and to be fair, you've got to get your um, <laughs> Uh, most highly compensated people a bigger raise so that they can keep cost with their inflation rate than you give to the people at the bottom. Um, uh, you know, I don't think that's right, um, uh, but that's the claim basically. So I should actually say I've, um, uh, the research cited here is by somebody called Christian Broda. He's um, now a hedge fund um, manager. Um, a uh, place called Dickens Capital. Um, I actually took a pretty close look at this research in a CEPA report two years ago. Um, and the first thing to know about it is that even if this is accurate, you know, this finding is accurate, it really doesn't change the inequality story much. Um, Broda himself says, this is in published research, it uh, maybe reduces income inequality by 2 to 5%. Um, but even this is really probably going too far because the research really just isn't credible, at least as to, to this claim. Um, the short story here, Brody uses research, um, basically private data collected by the Nielsen Corporation from households that volunteer to scan in uh, their uh, grocery purchases. They're mainly 
only signed up through the internet. Um, other uh, researchers have found all sorts of problems with the representat representative basically of the low income uh, people in this sample. Nielsen acknowledges it's a problem. Um, as I've detailed, there are really good reasons to believe that um, careful comparison shoppers are disproportionately represented among the low income households. And you know, when you look at that, basically that's kind of what produces this strange result in, um, in uh, the Broder research. One last thing about the Rotor research, just to give you a sense of how um, fringy I think it is. Um, he also says, he makes this argument, if we properly look at inflation and the differences between, um, you know, for the low income people, um, the income poverty line would be much, much lower than it currently is. So the current income poverty line uh, in 2006, $20,000 for a family of four, not a, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, a terrifically um, generous sum by any means if, you know, we think about trying to live on that. Um, but the correct income poverty line, according to Broda, is about $10,000 if you properly adjust for inflation. So the argument is here, if you believe this research, a family of four has to have a meaningful standard of living on $10,000 a year. I don't think there's any um, uh, buddy who would really seriously make that argument. You know, I mention this partly because I think, you know, partly what we see is a, is a sort of central strategy in a lot of the denialism that goes around on about inequality is this idea that we have to, you know, people going out of their way basic to the lower the bar when it comes to assessing the performance of the economy for middle and working class people. And the idea is you have to, you know, kind of pull the bar down uh, for the working class, for the middle class, and then judge it. And I think, you know, that's partly what you see here in this attack on Kruger and the middle class. I actually think the problem with Kruger's claim about the middle class is he sets the bar too low. We didn't have much uh, growth at the median. I don't think that's the right bar to use for judging the size of the middle class. I think it's much more... Um, sensible to use something like average income growth and think about that as being the bar you should set to judge on the middle class and average income growth really outpace the median. Okay, now, um, next point. Uh, another area we disagree about is the effect of inequality on the middle and, and working class basically and also on mobility and um, understanding why inequality um, increases, growth in inequality um, can come at the expense of working and middle-class people is actually pretty simple. Uh, here's a chart from um, Jacob Hacker, Paul Pearson's uh, recent book, Winner Take All Politics, uh, uh, I think an uh, important book. Um, and basically what you see here is there's the assumption, what if inequality didn't increase over the last 30 years and we had the same level of economic growth? What would have happened to uh, incomes for the working class, for the middle class? Basically, you know, no big surprise here, they would have had more money. The bottom fifth would have had about $6,000, not a ton, but a lot if you're uh, at uh, $16,000. This is for 2006, by the way, just to give you a sense. Uh, the middle would have had about uh, $12,000 more, so about a 20% um, uh, uh, gain here. Um, even the third fifth would have, have seen these increases. Um, the response... Um, uh, that Scott makes to this is what I would think of as really kind of the boogeyman government argument. What he has written is that you have to assume that whatever draconian regulation or redistribution government might have enacted differently would not have had a negative impact on growth. I think the real question here is why do we have to assume that we can moderate inequality without lowering economic growth and quality of life? Think about the experience of Europe. Um, kind of the core OEC countries of Europe during the same period. They grew at the same overall rate as the United States, but they had much more um, moderate growth in inequality. It's possible to do these two uh, things. And it is not hard, in fact, to come up with a very long list of things that U.S. policymakers could have done differently over the last 10, 20, 30 years, uh, things that they could have and should have done, uh, that would have had either a neutral or positive effect on economic growth, but at the same time would have moderated the growth in inequality. And I don't want to go through the long list. You know, you think about things like the estate tax. That certainly would have moderated the growth of um, uh, state tax repeal of wealth inequality. I, I don't see how it would have had any real effect on uh, economic growth. Think about financial policies and both the things government did, the bad things in terms of deregulation and the things it could have done. So wouldn't have been better from a growth and inequality perspective for policymakers to not have deregulated the financial markets in ways uh, that cost middle and working class Americans billions of dollars. Um, if, for instance, Berkeley Bourne had gotten her way 
and had been able to go forward with um, proposals to regulate the financial derivatives market, didn't get plowed over by Robert Rubin, by Larry Summers during the Clinton administration, wouldn't we have had more economic growth and probably less severe financial problems in this decade? I think that is just uh, you know very difficult to, to, to argue with. Um, health, health insurance, the same thing. If we had done the Nixon health insurance plan in the 1970s instead of a couple years ago, you know, would we have had both less um, uh, fewer uninsured, less inequality, and probably more uh, economic growth. I think that's the case. Um, okay, so now the other thing to say here, and this is kind of my last point, growth in inequality isn't just a drag on absolute incomes of working and middle class families. There are also very good reasons to believe, as I think Scott is disputing here, that it has a negative impact on the class mobility of the, the least advantage. I don't want to get into the details of the Great Gatsby chart. That's kind of been really... Um, <laughs> You know, there's been a graduate seminar on the web on that with people like Miles Korak and, and Justin uh, Wolfers uh, ably addressing a lot of these points. But I do want to note some recent research um, that I think hasn't been connected to this particular debate yet. And um, this is actually John Smith from CEPR, who's here, a, a great labor economist, uh, brought this um, to my attention and kind of pointed out the implications of this chart. So this is from... Um, Martha Bailey, Susan Dynaski of the University of Michigan. And you know, part of the issue we're talking about, are the children of the 80s um, going to have a harder time um, in terms of mobility than the children of the 60s? And I think this is actually directly on point here. And so basically, what you see are these two um, uh, cohorts, people who reached age 25. So the blue are people who reached age 25 in the mid-1980s. Um, without completing college, and then the gray are the ones who reached age 25 in the mid-2000s without completing college, and this is by income quartile. So um, basically what you're seeing here is that income inequality rose and sort of rippled through the opportunities of the well-off children born at the beginning of the Reagan era, the ones in the beginnings of their career now, are almost certainly going to have, um, have basically increase disproportionately in a way that will also almost certainly reduce mobility for the lowest uh, quartile. So the blue bars here show um, what you see, if you look at that lowest quartile group, so the ones that turned 25 in the mid-80s, some 95% of them hadn't completed college by age 25. Um, there was a little bit of movement there for the ones who turned 25 in uh, the 2000s, 91%, so a 4% decline. Maybe if that same, absolute same change had happened for all the other groups, you could say, yes, it's likely that um, we'll have um, uh, mobility staying the same. But look what happened. I mean, there's this widening disparity all the way down, and especially for the top half. So at the top quartile, you've got 64% uh, um, of the top quartile group uh, not completing college by age 25 in the 80s, whereas in the 2000s, it's down to 46. So an 18 percentage point difference compared to this 4% one. Um, and so basically, for upward mobility to have stayed the same, and to stay the same for this group coming of age in the 2000s, um, you have to believe that this small drop um, in non-college graduates in the bottom somehow allows them to really hold their own with the group in the top, where you've got this much larger disparity. I think this just does not seem plausible to me, especially given, as we know, sort of educational attainment has gotten even more important uh, during this period. Um, so I will kind of leave it there. I think you know, the next kind of question is some, some issues about uh, policy and what are the implications uh, for us um, thinking about this in policy. Okay, great. Let, let's um, open up the discussion here. Uh, we'll start with Scott giving some uh, response. And then, you know, I know we've got some, some ringers in the room, so I do want to open it up um, quickly to uh, some audience uh, engagement and questions here. And we'll have a mic uh, going around the room. Um, so, Scott, you want to um, take some time to, re to respond? Sure. That would be great. No, I appreciate that. Uh, is, this, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I appreciate the, the comments from, from Sean. He's right. We disagree about a lot. Uh, and I would, I would say we disagree as much, uh, 
with the the information he, information that he's presented as as uh, as he did with the information I presented. Um, so let me just kind of clarify a few points. So uh, it's certainly the case that growth has slowed uh, in the United States since the golden age. Uh, actually, it's slowed everywhere around the world, um, and, and uh, so to the extent that that we want to explain why that's happened. It's nothing that's unique to the United States. This is sort of, Tyler Cowen has argued, you know, we're at a technological plateau. There's, there, there are cross-national reasons uh, for why income growth has slowed. Um, nevertheless, it remains the case, based on Luxembourg income study data, uh, that from everywhere, fr uh, from about <coughs> the, the 20th percentile uh, of the income distribution, so the person who is poorer than 80% uh, of Americans, um, up to the top, that at any point along the way, uh, Americans are actually better off than, uh, than people in most European countries. So again, it's this issue of at the bottom uh, where we very clearly do look different. Um, on inequality, my testimony that I gave yesterday said that uh, the quote was that inequality had risen modestly, if at all, um, since the early 1980s. Um, and I, I think uh, that is based on uh, data by Rich Burkhauser. Um, which shows that if you compare the person at the 90th percentile to the person at the 10th percentile, uh, that person has about six times the income uh, of the person at the 10th percentile. Big number, uh, but it doesn't look like it's actually changed that much since the early 80s. Um, now, there was a, a run-up in inequality uh, in the early 80s. Um, uh, the, the, so I would qualify the it's been pointed out to me since that the, the Burkhauser study doesn't include capital gains, so I think that is a, a, a very valid issue to raise. Um, but the CBO data is not dispositive. Um, so the way that the CBO estimates are, are uh, estimated is that they match uh, IRS data, um, which is where the unit is a tax return. Um, so if you file married jointly, it's one tax return. If you file married separately, it's two tax returns. If you're a 17-year-old with a job at McDonald's and you file taxes, that's a tax return. Um, they take that and they match it statistically to uh, a survey called the Current Population Survey, which is another one of these workhorse surveys, uh, which, by the way, uh, has uh, a pretty big problem with underreporting of income at the bottom. Um, research by Bruce uh, Meyer has shown that uh, if you look at people in the bottom half, they report they spent about a quarter more than they report that they actually made an income. Uh, you might think some of that is people going into debt uh, to, to make purchases, uh, but they've actually looked at this very carefully. Um, the, the expenditure data actually uh, correlates with uh, a lot of the poverty problems that, uh, that we care about much better than the income data actually does. So you have these two data sets um, that are very different, tax returns and households. They statistically match them. Um, and uh, it is a very comprehensive measure of income. I'm, I'm not saying you should not trust uh, the CBO results, but it's not dispositive. Um, there, there are uh, these other data sets uh, out there. Um, the Broder research, I think, uh, with all respect, Sean, you just completely mischaracterized. Um, what Broder reports is that uh, if you look at the inequality between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile, uh, that shows a pretty clear increase um, uh, if you don't sort of do the adjustments that Burkhauser has done uh, since 1979. If you account for this differential inflation, um, that entire increase goes away. Uh, I'm happy to send a paper out to anybody who's interested in it. Um, but it, but it's Is that his published paper or the unpublished? Uh, this is the unpublished paper, but I don't think he's actually published results on inequality. He has the paper on poverty. He has, actually. Okay. Um, so, and this isn't fringy. Uh, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and if you want to consider them fringy, then, then you can do that. But they actually have two different papers that have shown the same thing, that inflation has risen less uh, at the bottom um, than elsewhere. Uh, your, your illustration uh, of, of sort of what Broda is assuming about the poverty line is, is uh, exactly wrong. Um, Broda isn't taking the $20,000 poverty line and saying it should be $10,000. He's saying that you should keep the $20,000 poverty line, but the poverty line in the past uh, actually should have been higher than, than it was because inflation was lower than it was. So if, if, if inflation is lower than it was, then that means uh, that the increase in income over time in real terms, was bigger than what the official data show. If, if the increase is bigger than what the official data show, then uh, then it turns out uh, that incomes were uh, uh, were higher in the past. Um, 
uh, I'm sorry, we're lower in the past. Uh, so it's not that you should take the, the current $20,000 poverty line and drop it down to 10. It's that you should keep the $20,000 $20, poverty line as it is, go back to, say, 1970 and raise that one. Um, so that, I mean, that's just completely contrary to what Broda argues. Um, last on, on, on sort of the Hacker Pearson stuff about if income growth had been broadly shared. I mean, it's absolutely true that mathematically, if you know that the, the numbers that he showed, you know, you can't dispute math. Um, but the real question that's just sort of assumed away is whether, in the absence of, uh, of of these gains to the top, whether any of that actually would have ended up in the pockets of of the middle or folks at the bottom. Um, in my testimony before the Senate Budget Committee, I gave two examples from 2007 to 2009. Uh, the top one percent share of income. Uh, dropped by a pretty good amount. It went back to its early 2000s level um, after having increased quite a bit during the 2000s. Uh, if you think that that benefited anybody uh, at the middle or at the bottom, uh, that's I think that's a tough case to make. Um, the second example I gave, Mark uh, Zuckerberg. Uh, so I think this is fascinating. It, so if Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, cashes in his, his stock options this year, he stands to make $5 billion uh, with a B. Uh, 80,000 times what the typical household in the U.S. has. I mean, these are these are incredibly bracing numbers, right? I, I'm not trying to sugarcoat them or anything. But the case that Sean has to make is that if somehow he were prevented from cashing out those those shares, that somehow that five billion dollars would would trickle through to the middle and the bottom. Uh, or uh, maybe uh, Sean believes that in 2013, when Zuckerberg won't have such a windfall, that we'll all be better off because he doesn't get that windfall. I just don't, you know, it, the, the connection between what uh, folks at the top make because of global uh, investors, um, uh, that somehow that, that money from around the world works its way into the pockets of, of the middle and the bottom, I'm, it, it, it can't be assumed, I guess, and I'll, I guess I'll just close there. And this is one of the, the very contemporary uh, challenges that we face is that uh, how we're going to approach and define inequality uh, really does matter. There's a lot of different ways to slice it and explain it. And I think the focus on what's happened at the very, very top, um, which has garnered a lot of attention in recent years, is, is very, uh, you know, is, is, is hard, to, hard to ignore right now because the trends have been so, so extreme where, um, and, and it might be consequential both to the overall distribution to some of the issues of economic growth, um, but it's also a very different issue about whether or not we're creating the same kind of opportunity for people at the bottom uh, to move upward and what the safety net looks like. Um, okay, so let's um, uh, open it up for some, some questions and, and, and dialogue here. Please give me your hands. Uh, let me know so I uh, can flag it around. Uh, Hannah's going to deliver the mic. Uh, let's start with one of our <laughs> ringers. Uh, uh, we're going to give Tim uh, Noah the mic in the front. Uh, and here, uh, Sean, you want to hand the uh, flag, the New Republic issue that uh, <laughs> is on the uh, right. table outside, and, and uh, Tim has a piece in there. Uh, uh, Tim morning. Noah from the New Republic. And I wanted to ask both of you to discuss, neither of you really discussed in much detail, uh, uh, Bell Saw Hill's conceit, which has been repeated by others, that as the rungs grow further apart, uh, it becomes harder to climb. I know there are a lot of people who feel that instinctively that feels like it makes a lot of sense with the caveat that w we can cite uh, at least one period when, when uh, rising inequality was the price of uh, 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 rising uh, mobility, and that would have been uh, the American Industrial Revolution, late 19th century early 20th century, uh, clearly uh, 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 Sawhill's uh, paradigm didn't apply there. But uh, under usual circumstances, it does seem instinctively true that what she is describing would, would pertain, that, that uh, as there's a further distance to travel, um, mobility would become uh, more difficult. So I've got to ask you both to address that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this gets back partly to that last chart I showed that Arnasky 
uh, Bailey stuff. And there's also, you know, uh, I talked about Scott's testimony yesterday. There's lots of good testimony from uh, uh, Heather Boucher, Jared Bernstein that really gets deep into this kind of, uh, you know, wealth of research, sort of um, puzzling out the mechanisms, kind of how does inequality basically, you know, not just in kind of the simple way, you know, how does it, um, it dynamically kind of reproduce greater inequality. Um, you know, so I think it's just, you know, part of this is just if you have inequality that has um, translated also into inequality in educational opportunity, you've got a, you know, a more highly educated group that has a lot more advantages at the top um, in their 20s, and then you've got this group at the bottom that has, um, uh, has not gained as much, uh, you know, in terms of education and other sorts of advantages, it just stands to reason that you know, there's going to be less mobility. That's, that's going to translate into less mobility, both because they have farther to go to reach that top uh, quintile, but also because they have fewer of the sort of advantages that are being transmitted uh, to the parents of, the, of those who are better off. Um, I, would, I would agree that logically, I, you know, it's a compelling metaphor, right? The, the rungs of the ladder growing further apart, it's harder to climb the ladder. Um, but, I, but I think it sort of elides uh, all these questions about where is income inequality increasing, where is uh, mobility then decreasing. Um, the, other, the other things, two other things I would say, the, 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 the kind of Gini coefficients that are the standard measure used, which are, you know, it, it, perfectly respectable. But they, they are driven by these changes at the very top. Um, so it is the case that as the top 1% uh, and even more, the top one half of 1%, the top 100th of 1% have pulled away, um, it has an outside effect, outsized effect on the Gini coefficients. Um, you get, you get, I mean, you, you still get increasing inequality, but the, the levels of the Gini coefficients are quite a bit different if you, uh, well, what, if you What does it look those. like if we take the very top out? I bet you have looked at that on the Gini coefficients. I mean, the U.S., if you stack them all up, um, yep. you know, really, we, we stick out there. Uh, do we still, I assume we're still on the edge, but less so? Yeah, I, I, I haven't looked at it myself, but, but certainly I think uh, Rich Burkhauser has and others. It, it lops, you know, it lops at a, something like eight or nine Genie points off. So the genie ranges from uh, from zero to one, uh, where one is is disaster. Uh, where basically the the, Mark the, 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 the uh, yeah, has, yeah. Uh, has it all. Right. Mark, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg gets <laughs> gets <laughs> everything. Uh, who's, not, who's not just th th how old? He's twenty seven. What is he now? Uh, yeah. Uh, so Mark Zuckerberg gets everything, not just uh, not just five billion. Uh, that's not that's just the capital brains tax capital gains tax cut. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the genie of one. The genie of zero is perfect equality. Um, so on that scale, uh, I, other people in the room probably know the, the actual levels offhand better than I do, but it, but it, it has an impact of about eight or nine percentage points, is my recollection. And, and it still increases over time. It's, I'm not arguing that, uh, uh, that this makes the increase go away. Um, the other point that I was going to make is that, uh, you know, theoretically, people disagree a lot, lots of times, and if you kind of push economists, they say, well, what really matters is wealth, actually, not income. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, that the wealth uh, measures tell different stories in some ways um, than uh, than the income measures do. Um, for instance, Sweden actually looks as bad as we do on wealth inequality, um, uh, whereas we look much worse than they do on income inequality. So there's, I, I think the the logic of the metaphor shouldn't kind of cloud the extent to, wh to which this is a really an empirical question that. Um, and I, and I think, unfortunately, that's what happens is, is people sort of start with a metaphor and then don't go further than that. And we have some, uh, yes, data limitations here. I mean, we know the recession has had an impact. We don't have the data yet to, to reflect that. Um, I think CBO actually does have. So 2009, uh, yeah. uh, and, and uh, you know, I think we're waiting for some 2010 data to come out from the Survey of Consumer Finances. And, and um, I've tried to argue uh, recently that uh, although we might see some declines in incomes at the very top, which might compress some of the income uh, inequality data, at, at the wealth inequality data, I think we're still going to see uh, some, some divergence at the very top uh, because, the, you know, the middle class owns their uh, lot of housing wealth that is really uh, still underwater and, and is evaporated, but a lot of the securities, the stocks have come back, or at least to levels, uh, along with capital gains uh, at the very top, and I think we'll see continued divergence through the uh, Great Recession with wealth inequality, and less so possibly. Now, whether that's just a blip and it's going to continue to, to um, <coughs> come back to its trajectory, we'll see. Uh, Stephen? Other hands? Let me know. Other hands? Okay. 
Come on, more questions in the back. Yeah, right here, Stephen. Steve Crawford, George Washington Institute of Public Policy. Hi, Scott. Hi, Sean. Um, I, was, I, I want to raise the issue of differences or variations by gender and race, but especially gender. Sean, you showed that slide from the, um, from the uh, Bailey and Donarski mm -hmm. article. And I think one of their key points, if I recall, right. was that much of the, that expanded sort of payoff to the upper to the, to the upper quintile, th their relative greater gains in college entry and college completion was driven by dramatic gains by daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, so, uh, and there are all sorts of questions raised about sort of black guys in the lowest quintile mm -hmm. and what's happening to them and perhaps especially in single family households and role model issues that that article raises and have been addressed elsewhere by Jacob, et cetera. Would you both just comment a little bit on sort of the relevance uh, of variations by gender and race in these mobility issues? Uh, no, I, I think that's a, it's an important point. Um, in, in some ways, uh, the, the vexing question, I think, for, for trying to figure out how we improve our mobility outcomes is figuring out what's going on with, with guys. Um, so even not just confined to guys at the bottom, uh, you know, it, what's clearly happened over the last 30 years is that um, the labor market has sent this, you know, bright flashing signal to people that, you know, if you want to make a lot of money, you're gonna have to get a college degree. Um, and women have responded in kind. Uh, so you see college graduation rates uh, for women uh, rising uh, pretty strongly over the last 30 years. For men, we sort of uh, have petered out. We, uh, there hasn't really been any increase in college graduation, uh, not just among men at the bottom, but just among men in general uh, in, in 30 years. Um, so I, I think it's a mystery. I, I, in the Social Genome Project, which is uh, a project uh, at the Center on Children and Families at Brookings that I uh, direct, um, we're trying to build a, a life cycle model that actually looks at kids from birth to age 40 and to try to figure out kind of what's going on. Uh, it's a challenging methodologically. Um, but one thing we're, fi <laughs> one thing we're finding uh, very clearly is that, uh, particularly on, on behavioral uh, kinds of outcomes, that gaps between boys and girls open up you know, at age five, they're there. Um, and then you get to adolescence and there's all sorts of problems with conviction and incarceration. Um, so I, th I think that is the, the great challenge uh, because I, you know, my read of the, of the cross-national data is that's where we're falling down is with the guys. I think the, the paper by Marcus Yanti that I cited actually did look at uh, sort of black and white men at the bottom and found that, uh, that even if you look at, at white men at the bottom in the US that we still uh, look pretty bad. Uh, against other countries. And yes, there's a big difference between the male wage levels at the median and, and the women's levels. And, and it's a different world that we're living in. And so it does make it harder. Not only do, don't we have the data, but conceptually, what should we be, we'd be looking at, you know, 20 years, 30 years in the past comparing till now? Um, okay, right. Uh, did you have a question here? Yeah, you. Yep. There's the mic. I'm Basil okay. Scarless. I actually deal more with European political and economic issues, but I wanted to bring... We had a cross-national chart here. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to bring in some aspect of that. Uh, with Europe's essentially free educa system of free education all through university and, free and also free access to health care, and I should also add reliance on essentially the public school to educate virtually everyone, uh, less reliance on private schools. Is that perhaps a major factor in some of the differences in income in our, between the United States and European societies. I, I think you know it may. I think it gets back to this question of can you have less inequality with the same amount as growth or more growth? And I think that is partly a story about educational and other institutions, including other labor market institutions. So, you know, certainly, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on Europe's educational institutions. The other thing I'd bring in to that is when you think about some of the early 
childhood educational institutions in Europe where they start very young and those are often universal. You know, I think that is very much a template, a direction that we need to be um, going in. Um, but I also think you have to think about, you know, what are the labor market, you know, connecting back to Stephen's point about, you know, some of these issues about uh, young men, uh, you know, I, I do want to say, you know, uh, you know, gender inequality is still a real problem out there, you know, when you look at wage inequality and things for women, but, you know, I do think we have to think about, you know, everybody can't go to college, what are the other sorts of institutions, you know, beneficial institutions, not prison, <laughs> that we want to expand and, you know, allow people to come of age in, um, in their 20s, that give them a real fair shot of um, competing, so they're not just out there, kind of, on their own. Um, like they are, I, I'm afraid, and you know we've left them for so many years. Don't underestimate healthcare costs. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I in 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 burdening some uh, income sectors. Yeah. So that's huge. I think that's another thing about the CBO stuff. I mean, we can go either way on the CBO stuff. They add in insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't necessarily take out um, disparate impacts of health uh, expenditures, out of pocket expenditures on here. And, and to emphasize something you, you just said about, you know, we've identified male wages at the median at the lower end, and then you've identified the criminal justice system, which has uh, grown to uh, really, uh, I think, cha you know, horrific proportions. Uh, that's a real challenge. And you know, what think tank in DC or across the country is going to look at criminal justice issues in, in, in uh, serious ways to, uh, to, to look at that? I mean, the, these numbers are uh, really just appalling. Uh, right here. And hands in the back, anyone? Let me know. Okay, others? Hi, Austin Nichols from the Urban Institute. And I'm just, uh, I'm wondering if each of the speakers could address what they think their findings or claims, I guess, uh, would mean for federal income tax policy. So it's very hard to evaluate any of these findings or assertions without talking about specific policies, I think. So we heard a little bit of education across Europe and, and the US. but. A federal income tax policy has some pretty clear implications. We've changed federal income tax policy a lot over the past 30 years, many, many times in different directions, uh, which is all tied up with the findings about uh, pre-tax and after-tax income inequality uh, and mobility. And I'm just wondering, so that the, for example, the statement about uh, about Facebook's uh, founder is that it doesn't hurt anyone else if he realizes five billion dollars in in uh, st exercises stock options and realizes five billion dollars in gains. Um, that's only true if uh, it doesn't affect anyone else's tax liability, right? Uh, so the way that we've done, we've, if you think about, you know, how the tax treatment of stock options has evolved over time, we've essentially decided to allow people, uh, allow corporations to write off uh, whatever costs they like and to p for people to claim uh, a very, very small uh, amount of, it, of that income as taxable income as well. So, I mean, clearly, that those decisions about tax policy have implications for how we interpret how the 1%, how the top 1% or the top 30% are doing relative to the rest. And just think about, just say a few words at least about what each of these findings has uh, to do with tax policy. You know, I mean, that's a great question. So the, the first thing I would say is that I, what I don't think, um, so the first thing I'll say is that I think uh, your views about tax policy probably ought to not hinge on their impact on mobility and inequality uh, is, is kind of my, my priors. Um, it, no, I, I mean, if you think taxes should be, should be higher than they are at the top, that's a perfectly valid uh, point to have, but I'm not sure that there's a ton of evidence to show that that would uh, reduce inequality. Exhibit A is, um, you know, if you look at the CBO figures that are pre-tax and post-tax, you, you're not going to, so the first order effect is not going to be to change uh, how how striking these charts actually are. Um, they look just as bad uh, after tax as, as they do pre-tax, uh, or they look just as bad pre-tax as they do after tax. The second order effects are, so if, you, if, we, if we put, uh, you can imagine at the, at the extreme, we put uh, some 100% tax rate on income above some amount, that would certainly affect uh, the way that corporations compensate uh, their, uh, their CEOs, it would, it would have some second order effects. Um, uh, I, you know this literature a lot better than I do, Austin, I, but my sense is that there, it's not a slam dunk, uh, despite what Hacker and Pearson uh, would, would have us all believe, that, that this would uh, necessarily uh, bring, uh, bring income inequality closer together, uh, or that it would, that it would increase mobility. Um, I mean, it, 
it, it, a big question is what it's used for, right? If you if you taxed away Zuckerberg's uh, uh, capital gains, you know, does that money go towards uh, you know a bigger mortgage interest deduction, or does it go towards uh, more public education, or or what have you? So I I think. I don't actually really know what to what to say to that, uh, unless you feel like the evidence is there that there actually are these second order effects. Um, uh, to my mind, it's just a, a big open question. But it would matter what the tax reform looked like. I, you know, I, I just and think you know the evidence is so clear here that <laughs> you can affect inequality and mobility through the tax system, and to kind of put it off the table, uh, it just seems. Well, you want well, let's I'm separate them. Let's do, talk about whether you can do it in good first. ways that yeah. increase. <laughs> Yeah, economic growth and reduce inequality and increase, you know, kind of all the things. I mean, just, you know, you can just go example, you know, we could spend an hour pulling out examples of how this is the case. I mean, think about one kind of recent one. So we're having this big debate over the payroll tax um, um, break, you know, Republicans fighting like hell to not allow that to happen or doing it with all sorts of, of contingents. You know, a thing to remember is that actually, you know, before it became the payroll tax cut, it was something called the working, making work pay tax credit, which was much more progressive. And this was part of the Recovery Act. It was really targeted, you know, it was a working and middle class tax cut where um, people at the bottom, working class people at the bottom got the, the biggest gains, but everybody up through you know, the middle of the income distribution also benefited. It was much more progressive. You know, going the payroll tax cut was kind of a compromise just to get it, you know, past Republicans that made it less progressive. Right. And now we're kind of at this question of, you know, do we even go further? I mean, you know, and, you know, part of the consequence obviously is when you get, you know, less progressive, one of the things you're doing is you're doing less to stimulate demand. I mean, you know, so you've got less in terms of economic growth. I just, you know, this is, you know, I think an absurd debate to even be, um, having, um, uh, you know, and I think, you know, it's much better to kind of debate, you know, I think what I think, of, you know, let me just get back, somebody like Isabel Sahil, you know, we disagree a lot on policy, but I think at least if we can kind of say, you know, here are kind of the clear parameters of the issue, um, and let's have a debate about policy, but I think, you know, with any bit of research, you can come up with 78 different ways why that's flawed, but we wouldn't have any debates then if we go through this exercise. Um, you know, so I think at some point we have to kind of say, you know, there's this reasonable body and consensus, and where do we go from there in terms of policy? Uh, yeah, this gentleman here. Hello, my name is Ari Amala from the Frederick Naumann Foundation. I have a question concerning education, with education being such a vital part of um, basically lowering inequality in the U.S., but tuition costs at the same time skyrocketing, outpacing um, inflation and um, or also wage increases. How can you get more people to study it? For me, coming from Germany, you know, it's, um, tuition is free. And we have actually a three-tier um, school system. So there, there, there is kind of a lot of inequality, but there are more and more people graduating and more and more people entering universities. Conditions are good, but at least everyone has the opportunity. So now, with especially the financial crisis, you know, making it harder to actually access, have access to um, uh, student loans and so on. How can you get more people into um, good universities in the U.S.? I, I think I think that's a really important question. I think we're starting to to uh, to hit on. Uh, programs that work. I'm thinking of, of things like uh, Success for All, uh, which is kind of aimed at young and middle school kids uh, to improve their reading skills and other skills. Um, there's a program in New York called Small Schools of Choice uh, that's having pretty big impacts on high school graduation rates. Uh, a place where Sean and I do agree is I, I, I do think that uh, we, we do have to figure out uh, how to help people who are not going to make it in college. Um, and there are, there are, I think, encouraging signs there, too, things like career academies. Um, so I, I, I think we're discovering what works slowly over time. I, I also think there's probably a grand bargain to be had, maybe this is naive, uh, that would involve uh, more spending on education coupled with uh, governance reforms uh, that, uh, that Republicans would support. Um, but I may be naive. 
Um, yeah, I think, you know, a good, I, the German example, I think, is good because it is an example of a country that I think thinks much more comprehensively about young people and, and youth development. Um, I do think, you know, I'm not an expert on, uh, you know, increasing higher education. I think part of it is just, you know, you know, at a minimum, you try to remove some of the financial barriers that exist. Um, I also think, though, that a big part of this is about job quality and how do we have better jobs for the majority of people. You know, the majority of jobs out there are not going to be uh, college-educated jobs either now or in the near future. And so you really do have to think about how can we make those better jobs. And again, I think this is an institutional. You know, I think it's partly about... Uh, you know, restoring collective bargaining rights and the ability of workers to, to unionize. Um, I think it's about, uh, you know, the, I guess it's, you know, even Mitt Romney now I think is on board with this idea of ind indexing uh, the minimum wage. Um, I think it's about um, other things, other elements of job quality. Um, it's not just about wages, it's about time, it's about benefits, making sure people have paid sick leave, paid time off, and that that's something available to people in the bottom third kind of tier of jobs and not just at the top uh, third of tier jobs. Um, yeah, I do think it would be very constructive to move the, the conversation eventually at another session, uh, broadly in, in terms of some of the policy levers that can be pulled uh, at this time that can uh, address some of the issues of, of, of growth and mobility uh, over time, looking at how the maybe some of the safety net um, operates. Um, you know, that, that is a separate uh, issue, though, from, from looking at, you know, what the, the data uh, and our conceptions of inequality and mobility are. Uh, and so I think we've, you know, begun touching on some of that material today. That there's a lot of information on the, uh, the respective websites um, uh, of Scott and, and Sean and some of the other organizations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Pew Economic Mobility Project really has been trying to produce uh, a very you know, sophisticated catalog uh, of material from a lot of different perspectives. And I'm um, not sure Aaron's uh, still in the room, but um, it really it, 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 there's a lot of resources there that I'd invite you all to, uh, to consider. Um, all right, well, thanks for your time uh, today. We appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Scott and Sean. And, uh, Thank you. Sure. Thank you.